Hey guys, welcome to the Learn Feng Shui podcast, where you'll learn feng shui from a classical point of view, taking out the myth and superstition. If you like weekly tips as well as fun folklore tales, you'll enjoy learning feng shui with me. Hey guys, today I wanted to talk a little bit about flowering trees and some things like that um, outside your home. So the theory says that if you plant you uh, certain flowering trees in certain areas outside your home, that you will activate what is called the house's um, peach blossom or um, a romance flower. And so I, what happens is that if you negatively um activate this area it's said that it can cause problems with adultery in the home and I thought this was a good juicy topic to kind of look at um so this is one of the ones that I I, it kind of borderlines on superstition for me I don't know um previously in other podcasts and videos I've made I always address the fact that you know putting plants out you don't have to be worried about it um most plants don't activate an area unless you're dealing with something like a a plant that sits in water, like maybe like a lotus flower or bamboo, or it's sitting in a large um, amount of water. And so usually that's, I've used this to activate an area before, uh, more specifically areas that do correspond with what is known as a romance flower or a peach blossom. And so I'm going to kind of get into where those areas are in a minute, but, um, Again, I'm always open to learning new things. And so I've been taking some classes this summer with a master in um, Singapore. And this is one of the things that he taught us. um, And I just thought I would share it because I found it interesting. So I'm always open to like learning new things and and being open. Um, I will say as a consultant, um, it does take some testing out. And so it'll be one of the things that I'll really have to kind of pay attention to now. Um, but as the, uh, you know, each case presents itself. And so you don't always get to do every feng shui formula or test every theory, um, as a consultant, because, you know, every home is different and every home requires a different amount of like calculations and, um, formulas that can be applied to it and you know and that's based on a lot of different factors and so if somebody doesn't have a flowering tree in the area that I'm you know looking at and they haven't had a problem with adultery in their home there's really no way for me to gauge it and so it'll definitely be something that I'm open to um kind of researching and finding out just as I have this feng shui journey so if you have experienced um an issue in your home and you feel like uh hey I have this flowering tree in the specific area um I I would like to talk to you so you could you could email me <laughs> and I'll, I'll put everything all the links below um yeah I really would like to include it in some case studies so um let's get to the specifics of it in this episode and um the second part is going to be um a folklore tale so let's get to the first segment all right guys so to kind of clarify and help you understand uh when your house will be affected. I'm going to try and explain a little bit of feng shui theory to you. Okay. So some of you may know, or you may have been familiar with the concept of what is called the 24 mountains within feng shui. And it's just a template that's laid over your space and it has 24 separate sectors on there. So most people know, um, you know, the eight directions within their home. So they're, you know, they know North, South, East, West. Um, this breaks it down a little bit further. So, um, what happens is, you know, you have your north, south, east, and west, you know, southwest, southeast, northeast, northwest, but it is actually broken down into three um, subsectors within the direction. So you'll end up with something labeled like north one, north two, and north three. Um, I do have a really good blog a post on my website, which I'll link to. And I do have a video. It was one of the uh, workshops that I did earlier this year where I talked about finding the animal signs within your home. Um, if you would like a free floor plan mapping, please message me, um, which I'll put a link below. All you have to seriously do is upload a floor plan. I'll stick my template over it and I'll be like, here's the subsectors. It's super easy, okay? Um, but for this, all you have to know 
is that um, as a feng shui consultant, when uh, anyone comes to your home, you know, a feng shui professional comes to your home, um, it's one of the first things I do is measure the direction your house faces. It, the direction your house faces tells a lot about the type of chi or energy that's coming into your home. And when your um, house is directly facing one of the subsectors that is associated with an animal sign, um, which it'll just be like a small 15 degree increment um, that is associated with that animal sign. So you have your animal signs and in between that you have all the elements. Okay, so the animal signs are called the earth branches and the um elements, you know, you'll have all the five elements in yin and yang polarity will be labeled, um, and they're called the heavenly stems. So if your house faces a heavenly stem, it is said that this, uh, peach blossom star, or the romance flower star is not, uh, impactful on your home. So it actually depends on what you know, degree your house faces. If it's associated with one of the animal signs, you know, if it's in the degree with one of the animal signs, that means your house is more likely to be impacted. And so for, for example, my house faces around 180 degrees. So that is labeled as South two, and that is associated with the animal sign of the horse. So if it were in the subsector of South one or South three, then it would be considered, you know, one of the fire elements, but, you know, sitting directly with that, you know, degree, the type of energy that I'm getting, it's more impactful and it faces what is called the earth branch. So hopefully that made sense and you're still awake. So if your house faces the animal sign of pig, rabbit, or goat, that means that the rat is the spot in your home. You want to avoid placing a flowering tree. Um, and you want to actually avoid placing water in that spot too. There's other areas you can use, but you want to avoid the animal sign that's associated with rat. If your house faces snake, rooster, or ox, you want to avoid the flowering trees in the south two area. So that would be the area associated with the horse. If your house faces the tiger, a horse, or dog, that means you don't want to have a flowering tree in the area that's associated with the rabbit, which would be the east. If your house faces a rat, dragon, or monkey, that means that you don't want to have a flowering tree in the areas associated with rooster. So that would be West too. So again, it's said to not have water or a plant of flowering tree in one of these areas. Um, and the specific examples that were given were pomegranate trees, peach trees, plum trees, cherry blossom trees, which I have. Thankfully, it is not in the north because that would be, I think, the romance uh, area <laughs> um, and an almond tree. But I've also heard like no banana trees. And I think one of the funnier things that I heard, like they were saying, don't plant uh, chili peppers um, in in the area, because if you do, that means um, the wife will be like, you know, like spicy. She'll be having a, you know, like a bad temper. And um, all I could think of was that I had planted at jalapenos uh, in my yard this year and I had a lot of them come out and so I think that's kind of funny <laughs> but um, again there weren't in my uh, romance flower area so um, I, maybe my husband dodged a bullet on that one <laughs> So one other thing that I wanted to kind of add is that um, these trees aren't always bad. Again, just really for a rule of thumb to make it easy on yourself, unless, you know, it's really specifically a concern, is to really just avoid putting trees in the north, south, and east, west of your home. You know, there's other areas you could plant the trees. Um, You don't want to put like a, fa a fountain or a water pond right in these areas. Um, it is said though, one, one thing I was a little bit unclear on is there is sometimes that it's actually very positive for your home and act, it could actually mean that your, um, children can have a chance to get married that year. And so, um, you know, that, that one was a little bit unclear to me and exactly, uh, when it was positive and when it was negative. A lot of times with feng shui, um, mo well, most of the time, um, 
when you look at your external um, environment, so look at where sharp roof lines are in relation to your home. Look at where like light poles, you know, power lines, um, those 5G towers, radio towers. If you have one of those in closer proximity to your home, that is the time you'll usually get a negative impact from uh, the bad feng shui in that area. Um, because what happens is a bad flying star will come in or more negative energy will come in and there's a, a bad external feature and that therefore impacts your home and makes that area of your home negative even when it had never been negative before. So again, just a theory on the trees. Um, and yeah, always look for bad external features uh, before you you know, try to activate areas of your home. Again, if you place a fountain out or, you know, but even the act of like digging and planting a tree definitely activates an area because you're groundbreaking and breaking up the earth, you know? And so anytime you do that, you do want to consult a feng shui professional, have them do some date selection things, have them, um, you know, uh, look at what area you're putting things in and, um, and you should have an easy, you know, easy go of it. So again, you don't have to be terrified of flowering trees or flowering bushes. Um, I put a lovely flower garden up this year and um, I was really happy with the way it came out. And I really feel like it impacted my space and held the chin in a really positive way. I love seeing all the butterflies and everything come and visit. So again, don't be paranoid about it. Um, but I just avoid planting trees in um, north, south and east and west. So for today's folklore tale, I'm going to be reading from Chinese fairy tales and legends. And this book again is by Richard Wilhelm and Frederick Martins. And it will be, uh, you know, referenced and linked below. Today's story is called The Flower Elves. And what I really like about this book is that they actually include, um, you know, a little bit of um, the history or a little bit of like, you know, the symbolism and stuff like that um, before or after each story. It'll have a little side note. And this here says to unlock the heavy symbolism of this fable, it might help to know that the willow and peach both represent immortality and the plum means renewal and pomegranate promises prosperity. So today is going to be a story called The Flower Elves. Once upon a time, there was a scholar who lived retired from the world in, in order to gain hidden wisdom. He lived alone in a secret place. All about his little house in which he dwelt, he planted every kind of flower, bamboo, and other trees. There his house lay quite concealed in its thick grove of flowers with only him and a boy servant who dwelt in a separate hut and carried out his orders. He was not allowed to appear before his master unless he was summoned. The scholar loved his flowers as he did himself. Never did he set foot beyond the boundaries of his garden. It chanced that once there was a lovely spring evening. It chanced that once came a lovely spring evening. Flowers and trees stood in full bloom and a fresh breeze was blowing. The moon shone clearly, and the scholar sat over his goblet, grateful for the gift of life. Suddenly he saw a maiden in dark garments come tripping in the moonlight. She made a deep curtsy, greeted him, and said, I am your neighbor. We are in the company of young maids who are on our way to visit the eighteen ants. We would like to rest in this court for a while and ask your permission to do so. The scholar saw that this was something quite uncommon, and he gladly gave his consent. The maiden thanked him and went away, but in a short time she brought back a whole crowd of maids carrying flowers and willow branches. They all greeted the scholar, and they were charming with delicate and slender fe uh, features, and they were very graceful. When they moved, their sleeves uh, ex hailed a delightful fragrance and there is no fragrance known to the human world to compare it with. The scholar invited them to sit down for a while and then he asked, whom have I really have the honor of entertaining? 
Have you come from the Lady of the Castle in the Moon or the Jade Spring of the Queen Mother of the West? How could we claim such a high descent? said the maiden in green with a smile. My name is Salix. I'm going to try and pronounce these names, guys. <laughs> then she pre- uh, presented another clad in white and said, This is the Mistress Prunifora. The one in rose is Percy- Persica. And finally, in the dark red gown, this is Punica. We are all sisters and we want to visit the 18 Zephyr ants today. The moon shines so beautifully this evening and it is so charming here in your garden. We are most grateful to you for taking pity on us. Yes, yes, said the scholar, embarrassed. Suddenly, the sober cloud servant announced, The Zephyr ants have already arrived. At once, the girls rose and went to the door to meet them. We were just about to visit you, ants, they said, smiling. This gentleman here has just invited us to sit for a moment. What a pleasant coincidence that you ants have come to. This is such a lovely night that we must drink the goblet of nectar in honor of you. They ordered the servant to bring what was needed. May we sit down here? asked the ants. The master of the house is most kind, replied the maids, and the spot is quiet and hidden. When they presented the ants to the scholar, he spoke kindly words to the 18 ants. They had somewhat careless, airy manner, and their words fairly gushed out, and from them came a frosty chill. So, um, I will say I'm reading this verbatim, and... um, I think in the translation, it's just very literal. So I'm, I'll am i try to interpret a little bit. Um, <laughs> uh, apparently, they it seemed like they kind of were dismissive and a little bit uh, mean to him. So meanwhile, the servant had already brought up a table and chairs, and the 18 ants sat in the upper end of the board, and the maids followed. The scholar sat down with him at the lowest place. Soon the entire table was covered with delicious foods, magnificent fruits, and the goblets were filled with a fragrant nectar. These were delights such as the world of man has never known. The moon shined brightly and the flowers exhaled intoxicating fragrances. After they were shared uh, food and drink, the maid rose danced and sung, and the sound of their singing echoed sweetly through the falling gloam, and their dance... Uh, was like butterflies fluttering about the flowers. The scholar no longer knew whether he was in heaven or on earth. When the dance had ended, the girl sat down at the table again and drank to the health of the ants in flowering nectar. The scholar, too, was remembered with a toast to which he replied well-turned phrases. But the 18 ants were somewhat careless. One of them raised a goblet, accidentally poured some nectar on Punica's dress. Mm -mm. Punica was a young and fiery and very neat young woman. And seeing the spot on her red dress, she stood up very angrily and said, You are very careless. My other sisters may be afraid of you, but I am not. This angered the ants too, who said, How dare you, young I don't know what this word is. It says, how dare you, young chit? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, insult us in such a manner. Maybe it's supposed to be a, a slur there <laughs> or a, a, a bad word. I don't know. <laughs> With all of that, they gathered their garments and rose. All the maids crowded about them and said, Punica is so young and unexperienced. You must not bear her any ill will. Tomorrow she shall go uh, to you, switch in hand and receive her punishment. But the 18 ants would not listen and left, and thereupon the maids also said farewell, and they scattered among the flower beds and disappeared. The scholar sat for a long time lost in his dreams and longing. We live in your garden, they told him. Every year we have been tormented with naughty winds. Not sure what that, what that means. <laughs> so we have always asked the 18 ants to protect us. But yesterday, a punica insulted them, and now we fear no one will help us anymore. We know that you have always been well disposed towards us, and we are heartily grateful. And now we have a great favor to ask. 
that every New Year's Day you make a small scarlet flag, paint the sun and the moon and the five planets on it, and set it up in the eastern part of the garden. Then we sisters will be left in peace and we will be protected from all evil. But since New Year's Day has passed for this year, we beg you to set up a flag on the 21st of this month. For the east wind is coming and the flag will protect us against him. So I'm just going to say it. If they're scared of the wind, they probably live here in West Texas with me because I'm scared of this wind too. It's crazy, y'all. <laughs> um, it'll uproot trees. It's crazy. Okay. <laughs> so the scholar readily promised to do as they wished. And the maids all said with their single voice, we thank you for your kindness and we will repay it. Then they departed with a sweet fragrance and it filled the entire garden. The scholar made the red flag and early in the morning of the day in question, the east wind really did begin to blow and he quickly set it up in the garden. Suddenly a windstorm broke out, one that caused the forest to bend and broke the trees, but only the flowers in his garden did not move. The scholar noticed that a salix was the willow, prunifora was the plum, persica was the peach, and the saucy punica was the pomegranate, whose uh, powerful blossoms the wind cannot tear. The 18 zephyr ants, however, were the spirits of the wind, and in the evening the flower elves all came and brought the scholar radiant flowers as gifts of thanks. You saved us, they said, and we... We'll never have uh, anything else to worry about. If you eat these flowers, you will live long and avoid old age. And if you, in turn, will protect us every year, then we sisters, too, will live long. The scholar did as they told him and ate the flowers. And uh, his figure changed and he grew young again, just like the youth of 20. And in the course of time, he attained hidden wisdom and was placed among the immortals. To support the podcast, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and share with your family and friends who you think may be interested especially if you found this content useful. To learn more about feng shui and Chinese metaphysics, follow the link to the website below.